Keith Knudsen from Dakota College, and we're going to talk about hydroponics. Okay. So oh, I'm happy to be here today. Um, so we always talk about soil, don't we? And all of a sudden we're talking about something with no soil in it. So it's kind of interesting. I, I know when Jaden, when Jaden called me and he said, uh, asked me if I'd come down and speak, I thought, yeah, I wonder what it's going to be about. And then he said, well, hydroponics. I go, Minokan Farms and hydroponics, two different, totally different things. But um, I'm going to talk today about how we can use hydroponics. Is that the light over here on the... Uh, for for growing plants kind of you know pretty much indoors we use hydroponics for growing plants and it's uh it's done on a commercial basis and it's also a lot of people do it as hobbies so um, i've got an example of a hydroponic system here it's called lettuce grow um, i'm not promoting it but about a month ago they sent me this system and they said will you use it in your class to demonstrate hydroponics I said yeah so it's a sales gimmick I know it was but they also sent me little plants like this and that's what they look like they were all filled up but some of the lettuce got so big that I, I didn't want to bring it with today so we're we're using it so within a month we had plenty of food um, say on a small scale basis so uh, a little bit about Dakota College. We're up in Botano, North Dakota. Most people know where Botano probably is. Uh, we also have what we call the Entrepreneurial Center for Horticulture. And at that center, we do a lot of promoting of horticulture throughout the United, throughout the state of North Dakota and into some of the states around. So we have a, quite a number of projects that we do. We have a project here with Minokan Farms where we partner with them where we talk about uh, practices that are good for soil health and production and examples are is, uh, the high tunnel that they have here. Irrigation is another one. I think I could go on and on. Composting is another one. Make some teas, uh, cover cropping. There's just a lot of different ones. So that's one example. We do have a couple of grants that we work with some of the tribes in North Dakota. We work with uh, Turtle Mountain and on a very similar type of situation where we're duplicating some of the same practices. We have uh, Spirit Lake in Fort Totten where we're helping them build an aquaponics operation. So hydroponics is growing plants in a soilless substrate. Aquaponics is the same thing, but we add fish to it. So instead of, instead of fertilizing, in hydroponics we fertilize, we add fertilizer. In aquaponics we add the fish, and the fish waste is and bacteria break that waste down so we can use it as a nutrient. So, um, where did Sue go? Did she disappear? She said she listened to me. <laughs> but Sue and I worked together on one. We were working on a project and we're just, it's just finishing up. Uh, we're working with uh, developing a tool kit, kit for farmers, beginning farmers, and individuals that are veterans and Native Americans and we're trying to come up with this toolkit. So we've just got the, the booklet done on that. So it'd be kind of interesting when that comes out. Oh, let's see, we got a hemp project going on. That's a USDA project. That is a project to develop a hemp program, a cannabinoid type hemp program. We have the CBDs, the CBGs, that type of thing. So that's gone along pretty good. Um, it's, uh, we do some research, we've done some research with NDSU on hemp production too. So. so just a number of different projects, but we're here to talk about hydroponics today. So I'm just going to jump right into that. I don't know if I can beat the last presenter. Boy, she has a lot of energy, doesn't she? That was great. So in, in hydroponics, a lot of times we talk about it being in a more of a commercial basis, uh, what, we, what I call a controlled environment uh, situation where we're controlling the water that we put in, we're controlling the nutrients that we put in, uh, temperature, sunlight, all those type of things. So in a small operation, if you have one in your house, you do a very similar thing. You, you need to provide light for the plant. And I'm going to go through some of this stuff too. So you provide the water and you provide the nutrients. 
We're going to talk a little bit about the different kinds of systems. For instance, this is what we call a vertical NFT system. It'll sound easier as we go through it. We'll talk about light, water, nutrients, and then a little bit at the end about food safety. <clears throat> so in a controlled environment system, uh, a totally controlled environment system, that would tend to be in a building like this. This is a perfect example of a controlled environment system. And in a greenhouse, we're controlling most things, but it's difficult to control the temperature in the wintertime. You can if you pay for it. But you're also getting light in, a natural sunlight in. So um, it's not totally controlled because in a room like this, we can control the light too. So that's a, what we call a totally controlled environment is when we're in a setting like this. Oh, and ask me questions as we go along here too. I don't make sense. Hydroponics is not something that's new. The Aztecs used it thousands of years ago when, it, when they had issues with being crowded on a small area. And so they built rafts and in those rafts then they, they put their vegetables and their, their different uh, fruits. So, and then they floated them out onto the water. So hydroponics is not new. Um, it's been around for a long time. And of course, there you can have a situation where you've got water that's probably full of nutrients. It may have some salts in it, but it's very similar. So, so the system we're going to talk about today is deep water culture, NFTs, uh, bucket system, ebb and flow. And then I'm going to talk about rock wool too. And rock wool really fits in with a lot of different types. But uh, a rock wool is actually just a a rock that's been heated up and then spun. It's kind of like cotton candy. And it forms a, and, and then of course you can form it in different figures. And, and I'll go through some of those substrates with you as we go along. So here's a deep water culture system. And what that basically is, is a trough that has a liner in it and it's got water in it. And, and we say deep water typically because it's like 12 inches deep or so. So uh, when we have that kind of a system, then we have a, a styrofoam over the top and then we put our plants in there. And a lot of times uh, the, to keep the plants from falling through, we use something called like a net cup where we'll have the plants sitting inside here. It's probably started in rock wool and then we set it inside here and then we put it inside those styrofoam or on those, those rafts. We call them rafts, so. Uh, I can pass this stuff around. I don't know if you're interested in looking at it or not, but that's a net cup. And so there's a lot of different types of net cups and they're used a lot in, in particularly in the deep water system, so. Uh, some of the advantages to it, you can grow, um, you can grow with rather stable wa stable situations. If you have a lot of water in a, in a bigger tank, you know your temperatures won't fluctuate as much. Your fertilizer rates won't fluctuate as, as compared to maybe a 10 gallon versus a thousand gallon system. So the larger the systems, the better. And, and this, uh, this bottom picture here, this is common. You can see where large greenhouses and and what that is, is that's rafts on top of the water and floating. And so they, they start at one end of the greenhouse with small plants. And then at the other end, they're pulling the mature plants off and then they're pushing the rafts down. So that's a rather large system. Uh, we have a small system at DCB that we use in our aquaponics system. And it's uh, very similar to that top one like that. So, um, one, a couple of things about that, though, is, is that you can see that's a styrofoam. I would caution you if you're going to use styrofoam in a system like that, that you use something that's more food grade. It doesn't leak out a lot of the chemicals that some of the foams do so, into the system. The other thing is plants, a lot of the oxygen that a plant gets comes up through the root system. And we know that if we see a wet field out there, and the water sits there, it turns, the plants start beginning to turn yellow. And that's because they're just 
playing on getting oxygen. So when we look at this kind of a system, well, we go, well, that's the same thing. Well, it is if you don't include oxygen in your system. So we always have an aerator in the water that's constantly bubbling, and that's putting oxygen back into the water at all times in a dissolved oxygen form. So, so that's what keeps that kind of a plant looking good and green all the time is because of the amount of oxygen that we have in the water. And some of the, and most of the other systems that I'll show you today, you don't necessarily need to have aerators in it because you have water that's surface, the surface of the water is constantly touching air. In this case, there's not a lot of surface wa air there, surface to water air there, so. Any questions on deep water culture? It's deep water because it's like, typically the water is a foot to a foot and a half deep. And I'll get into some of the nutrient what things. Plants work best in this system? Really good question. So in this system, lettuce is a, is one of the main plants that's grown in a in a system like this. Lettuce. Um, some people have tried strawberries in them too, but lettuce is really one that seems to do well. Or or greens, I should say, not just lettuce, but any kind of greens. So like a like a bok choy does really well in it too. Trying to think. So my students are always trying to do different plants in the in the systems. I was just trying to think of anything else. Oh, I know, kohlrabi. So one of the students tried to figure out how they could get their kohlrabi to sit in there, and and the kohlrabi did rel relatively well too in there. I don't, I suppose because it's a similar type of a plant. So NFT systems is probably one of the most common systems. It's nutrient flow technique. So you have water that's flowing by the roots. And it's just a film or a nutrient film technique where it's, it's very thin film of water. Um, it does save a lot. This system does save a lot of water. And, and it also um, uses a lot fewer materials, but the materials it uses tend to be more expensive. So uh, I don't know, you know, you kind of balance that a little bit too. Um, it's very adaptable to spaces and plants. And I'm going to show you some examples of that in the next slide. Um, this system is kind of a fragile system, though, if, if the power goes out, because you've got a pump that's constantly pumping water by the roots. And if that pump goes down, then the roots dry really quick, dry up really quickly. So within a couple hours roots can dry. There are some things you can do to improve on that. For instance, if you start, if you start your plants in a rock wool, this rock wool really retains water relatively well. So it's kind of a buffer for situations like that. Uh, the roots can clog the system because there, there's times when you're moving the plant, uh, the, the roots will break free. And then of course, then that flows into the to this reservoir and back through the pumps, so that can be an issue. We do have water temperature fluctuations. So if you think of this particular tank here, um, sun shining down on it, it's definitely going to heat the water up. And so that tends to be an issue. It's not so much of an issue for us, uh, except for maybe in the summertime. But if you go south, it's an issue because there's just, it's not a, enough water there to buffer it. So, so that tends to be an issue with that. Um, and of course, it doesn't work real well with big plants. And when I say like big plants, I'm talking about typically tomato plants where the plant sits in a tray and it, it tends to fall over. So, and I'll show you some of those. Okay, I'm going to go back. So when I was talking about a tray, here's an example of a tray. And what it is, it's about that wide, about that deep, and then it can be uh, rather long. It can be 8 to 20 feet long. And so you, plant, you, you put your netted plants or your pots right in each one of those holes. And then water flows through that system. 
Here's the system that we have at DCB. Um, there's there's little tubes there. Water flows in from one end and then flows through. Back, there's a big pipe on the back side, and then that flows back to the reservoir. It just constantly recircles all the time. So, uh, so just to give you an idea from a production standpoint, that width of that table is uh, eight feet, eight feet wide, and it's about 40 feet long. And we've got it set up where we can produce about a thousand head of lettuce a month or about 12,000 a year under ideal situations. And so there's things when I say ideal that are, that come into effect. Um, one of the things is, is that in a NFT system like this, you're very capable of utilizing every square inch of it. And you'll notice here the width of this system right here is different than the width of that system. So we would, on the left side, we would start our plants in this, in pots that are very close together and then we would transfer them into this large to this larger size here but that's all on one table so so and of course lighting is also a huge factor but here's an example of and this is not the same crop of this but it's the same table of, of lettuce when it's ready to go so it does really well in an nft system lettuce does and you can do that on a small basis like that so any questions? Okay. You probably touched on this, but where do you market all of this stuff? This we market directly with our food service right on campus. Okay. We get we over we oversupply them sometimes though. <laughs> when you think if once we in the winter time we have a thousand heads of lettuce, they don't know what to do with it all. So we we have a farm store too that we sell quite a bit through that. Um, we're talking. So that's under ideal situations. But when we're talking about students, we don't always have ideal situations because stuff happens. <laughs> you know, they, they may forget to leave the system down overnight and then we lose a bunch. But, but uh, we, we've been able to market that way. I know the local grocery store has talked to us about maybe supplying some of the lettuce too. Um, there is a lettuce supplier south of Jamestown, and I know that he markets uh, a rather large area around Jamestown, too. And you notice the different colors? So at that, and this one is, doesn't have that, but at that time, the chef at uh, Sedex, or our food, food service company, he wanted different colors and different textures all the time, and there's just a ton of different colors and textures that you can get lettuce in so we were providing that a little bit differently that picture so here's another example of an nft system it's a vertical this is a vertical but um, we also have verticals where it's a channel and inside that channel we've got a fibrous material and at the top then water runs trickles all the way down and and we put our plants right into the the system. This is a system at uh, DCB, but there's the middle one is kind of an example of of something that you could build. You can use actually use pipe and build it. I I did it. Uh, I I did some as an example one year, but I just took a three inch pipe. I drilled a, I think it was like a one and a quarter inch hole, and then I got a dowel and what I did is I heated the area up around that pipe and then I just made it kind of a nest so that a, a net cup could fit in it. But, and then I used a fibrous material in the pipe. So, so you can make your own systems relatively easy. Another one that works relatively well is where you take pipe and you, you lay it horizontally on some kind of a stand where your water will flow through the pipe. And of course, then you have holes where the net cup fits in it. And then you can have a series of pipes going up or back and forth too. But that's a NFT vertical system. And then we get into what we call Dutch or, or Beto buckets. And those are buckets that are used very commonly. I'm going to back up because somebody maybe wants to know what you can do in vertical. You can just about do it anything in vertical. Here's the, here's this top row is basically herbs, then we've got greens, 
Um, I even had students who took uh, melons and planted them in that on that wall, and then they made a netting so that the melons could kind of move along. And so you can do just about anything with with vertical systems. This is a bucket system. This is very common in uh, indoor tomatoes, tomatoes, cucumbers, and peppers. So when we talk about those three, we like to talk to talk about them as being vines. So a tomato tomato plant can be a bush type or a determinate type plant that only gets so tall, or it can be a vine type plant where it's what we call indeterminate. And an indeterminate plant, a tomato plant will bloom forever if you let it. It will grow forever. I had one tomato plant that was four years old and still doing really well. So it just continued to grow. But the root system is massive after a while. So um, the thing about a, a vine type plant is it blooms as it goes. And then, of course, you get your fruit as it goes. So so, and you can also do that with peppers. Peppers, there's vine type peppers that you can do the same thing. You, you can grow them. And then cucumbers, of course, are that way. So, um, this, and I, and I should mention that you'll notice there's a cover on these. Almost everything that you do in hydroponics, you got to cover up the water because of algae. So, Everything and so the deep water raft system was rather easy because you've got this foam over the top. This system is pretty much covered up. There are some systems, though, I would caution you that you would need to make sure you cover them up so you don't get the algae growing because it's an ideal situation for algae, too. So, so Dutch buckets, tomatoes, cucumbers, beans, peppers, eggplants all grow well. Most of them are vine types. There are some disadvantages with this type of a system. It's the cleaning process is a little more tedious to clean them once you, once you set that up. Uh, I'm going to go back and talk about that. I've seen places that have used like five gallon pails and, and made their own system. So basically the way this works is you can see a tube on the top. That tube is just sitting in here. That's your water flowing in. And then you can see this. Uh, pipe down here well there's a hole in this bucket right here and so water water is flowing flowing back and then flowing back into the, the reservoir on those so it works relatively well we have we have I'll have students start plants here this next week at uh, DCB and then I'll have them tear them down in the spring but the tomato plants typically are 25 to 35 feet tall by that time. So, so what happens is, is that, of course, we don't have buildings that tall, but what happens is we just kind of wrap the vines around the bottom as it goes up. So, so that's the bucket system. Works good. Um, one of the issues that we found is, is that a lot of the plants, the roots will grow down into this pipe and plug the pipe up. So it's a maintenance thing is kind of regularly go ahead and pull the bucket up, see if there's any roots growing down there because it will plug it and then water flows all over the place. And then after the water flows for a while, then it runs out of water and then you've got issues with pumps and everything else. So. But that works pretty good. In the, yeah, it's it's indefinite if you use the indeterminate or the vine type tomato plants. They'll go go forever, yeah. Yeah, you know, I the the ones that I the one that I uh had for like four years, I cut the vines back almost to the root system and I got a one sprout to come back and then did it again. But the issue there is the root system becomes very massive. It just doesn't fit in a bucket anymore. Yeah. So in most of those cases, nine to 10 months is probably typically about as long as you'd want to do it, to have them in there. And with hydroponics, when it comes to tomatoes, you almost have to use a little thicker skin tomato. 
because if you let the tomato get to the point where it's almost ripe, it'll burst because there's, it's, it's pulling up so much water all the time. It's, there's not a droughty situation at all for this tomato. And uh, so, yeah, you'll get a lot of cracking of tomatoes, that type of thing. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. It's. I think it's more because there's a the water content is a lot higher, and there's something to say about natural nutrients too. I I I strongly believe that natural nutrients have a, help a plant develop some of those flavors. I might be wrong on that, but I believe that. <laughs> because I've grown up on on uh, mostly vegetables and soil, I think, and I, and again, I think part of that is is because of the amount of water in the the vegetable or the leaf that that dilutes that flavor a little bit. So I know, like when I pick berries, I pick, and this is off. I pick berries late in the day because I always feel the flavor is a lot stronger especially after a warm day in a berry than it is like in the morning. So I think that's just kind of falls through. So. Although aquaponics, there's a lot of good flavor. It seems like there's, I can tell the difference between a hydroponics lettuce leaf and an aquaponics lettuce leaf. And so in aquapon in hydroponics, most of the time we use what we call a salt-based fertilizer, and in and of course in aquaponics we're using an organic type fertilizer. Maybe it's in my head. I don't I don't know, but I just I just like the organic type situations. So ebb and flow is the next system, and and what what I mean by ebb and flow is is that. You have a situation where water is filling a tank and then at some point something happens where it drains back out. So it's called an ebb and flow system. And there's a couple of different ones. Uh, this is one that I have with the P-Rock at, at my farm. You can see that little white circle there. And it's called a bell siphon. So you have a large pipe that sits in that tank that's got tons of holes in it, but the, 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 that only acts as a filter. It keeps whatever your substrate from falling in to that point. And then you have another pipe right here that's capped. And then right in the center, you have another pipe. And so water flows into here. And then this one pipe here, there's holes at the bottom of it all the way around. It's capped. So then water tends to flow through the holes and up when this water level gets to that point, up and into this pipe right here. What happens then is that it also pulls the, pulls the air with it and creates a vacuum. So then we've got a situation where it's going to suck pretty much all the water down to the point where that hole is, and then air fills this cap back up again and it stops. So it's a a start and ebb and flow type system there. And that works relatively well. You have to tweak the pump, pump amount a little bit. But this is another system here where you've got a pump that starts like this one just did, fills up the bed for you, and then there's a, a small pipe that's constantly draining some water, but it can't keep up. And then that pump stops, and then that pipe manages to drain all the water down and then the pump kicks in again it's so ebb and flow the advantage of that is is that in between then you're getting a lot of oxygen to the roots when it's down so that's a rather inexpensive system to build too especially if you use p rock there's the issue with p rock and i'll get to that though anybody know what the issue would be with p rock Okay, we'll get to it. Um, a little bit on rock wool. There's, rock wool is used a lot in the commercial industry. That's this material. Uh, this is another material similar to, to rock wool, 
although the difference between this and this is, is that this hardly ever breaks down. So if you're going to use it in a garden or outside, you're going to have these little cubes for a few years hanging around. This material tends to break down. Oh, uh, here's another one. This is an organic one. And this material, of course, breaks down. The only issue that, I, that we've noticed with this is that this retains water a lot better than this does. And so we end up with some, losing some plants with this type of a, a material. So it's just a fibrous material. Actually, when I bought it, they told me it was made out of hemp, but I don't see that anywhere in, on, the, on this label. So, so, uh, but, so there are advantages to it because it, it's, when it's made, it's made in a very hot, I think it's like 12 to 1400 degrees. So it is typically sterile. Uh, it holds water really well, but it doesn't break down. So that's an advantage and a disadvantage. And if it does break down, then all these little particles get in your system and they plug it up. So, so there's kind of different sizes. This top one is used. I'm going to go to the next one because I think I've got a picture of it there. Nope. I don't. Um, that, that one is used a lot in the tom commercial tomato industry where they, they start the tomato in its block and then that, they set that block in a channel and you've got a number of blocks up and down that, um, that they put, apply a nutrient rich water to it and then the channel drains off any excess. So I think I have that someplace, but I don't remember. Oh, I'm going to get to it. So, and there's a number of different substrates that you can use. If we look at crops that work really well, lettuce, a leaf type lettuce works really well. That's kind of probably one of the most common. Tomatoes is very common. Peppers, uh, cucumbers, and strawberries, those are very common in, in use. But I have not found anything that really, you can't set it up so that you can use it in hydroponics. Just about anything does. The only ones where I caution you is if you're doing it as a root crop. There's some issues with pathogens being able to uh, reside in the root of a plant. And typically as, uh, as a, that pathogen goes into that plant, there's more filtering that goes on. So your fruits and uh, produce typically don't have pathogens internally, but the root could have. And so we tend to stay away from root crops when we're talking about hydroponics or aquaponics. Here's an example of uh, strawberries. Strawberries is one that's very commonly used for Hydroponics, strawberries do well in a, in, in a system like this too. They do really pretty good. So. so when we talk about, I'm going to flip over to commercial side. I imagine most of you are probably more interested in home, but when we talk about some of these commercial types, there's times of the year when a produce is worth more than other times of year. Example, this is a perfect example, strawberries typically to a producer are worth more in the winter time, of course, especially in our country because they're not having to be shipped in. So if you had an aquaponics operation and you thought, well, I'm going to grow strawberries year round, that might not be the best advice because you can grow strawberries in a high tunnel really easy in the summertime and cheap, cheaper than you can in a, in a, in a greenhouse. So it's something to think about if you're doing it on a commercial standpoint. Okay, here's where the tomatoes are, and you can see those, those uh, Rockwell cubes are used there in that situation. Like I say, tomatoes are very common. Uh, there are some crops, and I'm going to get into lighting a little bit. There's some crops that need a lot of light. Tomatoes, cucumbers, and peppers need more light. So if you're going to do this at home, and you, you want to grow those three, you really need to probably have them close to a window and then some additional light with them. So, and this particular unit, I haven't, 
I haven't seen it, but I was talking to a lady last week in Bismarck and she said she bought this unit and they also provided her with lights, a ring of lights around them. So I guess you can get it with that system. And of course, we talked a lot about lettuce already in the NFT systems. Lettuce, lettuce works really well in hydroponics if you want to try to grow some lettuce. Uh, peppers is another one. Here's a vine type pepper, indeterminate type pepper. Warm, warm temperatures, part of the nightshade family, warm temperatures and lots of water. Uh, basil, basil is, is a common one. I've got basil in here. Uh, very commonly used in most of the systems too. Basil does good. Lots of herbs will do good in a, in a hydroponic system. So. There, this particular system, uh, we have one of these at, at DCB. It's got a, it, and instead of using a tank like this, we put it over an aquarium with fish in it. And so the cover sits on top of the aquarium. And so we're pumping water out of the aquarium through the, through the root system and back down. And that does a couple of things. It supplies fertilizer for the plants, but then also it aerates the water for us too, for the fish. So it's kind of, it's kind of a neat type of a system. But that is, that's, uh, you, can't, you can see that it, occasionally in homes where they've got a, a lighted kind of uh, hydroponic system with an aquarium. So. Oh, and you know, one thing we don't hardly ever think of is cut flowers. Um, cut flowers is, is becoming more popular, and you'll see that at a lot of farmer's markets where somebody's got cut flowers. And so that is an option, too. Uh, you know, when you when you think Think about roses or tulips, those type, especially roses. A lot of those are grown in greenhouses. So cut flowers is always an option too for, for hydroponics. Light. Oh man, light in North Dakota. If we're going to grow things in the wintertime, light is one of those things we really need to consider. When we so. I'm just going to jump into the next slide. So when we talk about light, we see light uh, in a room. That may not necessarily be the light that's adequate for a plant. We always try to think, well, we, we have lots of good light in here. Plants should do well, but that's not necessarily true because the light that we see falls into uh, this chart here and plants need a lot broader spectrum of light than just the, the white light that we see and so we don't always realize that but uh, we have ways of measuring it so this broad area of, of light that a plant needs uh, is called what we call photosynthetically active radiation PAR or what we call I call PAR all the time and so we measure PARs, what we do, and that helps us determine, are we giving our plants enough light? Within that range, though, there are some colors or some types of light that are not used very well. Does anybody know what one of those light colors would be? Plant can't really use. Uses a little bit of it. What's the color of most plants? Green, yeah. So green is a color that uh, is not readily absorbed by plants for photosynthesis, so it reflects it back out. So the green is one of those colors. just doesn't work well. But it loves the blues and it loves the reds in particular. So in a commercial world, we try to focus more on colors in this area here and colors in this area here when we when we talk about growing plants. <clears throat> it's 
So, um, we talk about PAR, we talk about that part of the light spectrum where photosynthesis works, where plants can absorb it. <clears throat> but then how do we measure that? And we measure it in what we call um, micromoles per meter per second. So uh, what we're doing is, is think of a light as a, a, a raindrop. We call them photons. And that's the smallest part of a light. And each light has different colors. So as that light, that photon hits the surface, we, we monitor that. We, we determine how many of those are, are happening. And so we uh, want to count those photons, believe it or not. And when we have a plant, each plant needs a certain number of photons every day. And so we call that um, daily light integral. And so some plants use a lot and some plants don't. Tomato uses uh, 25 to 30 DLIs a day. And I won't get into this too much because I can see people yawning. But um, lettuce doesn't use as much. And so um, I can grow lettuce in the wintertime without light. It's going to take me about 90 days in my greenhouse. But if I provide it with the right kind of light, it'll take me 50 to 55 days. So it'll grow a lot faster with the extra light. And, and that's the same way with tomatoes. Tomatoes is kind of peculiar because it'll decide it doesn't want to blossom if it doesn't have a lot of light. It just keeps vegetating, putting out, putting out branches and leaves. So. The other part of that is, is when you're thinking about light, Light doesn't come like this and fill the whole area. It's kind of, we talk about light footprint. And so uh, we measure light. And typically, in the corners of a light, we're not getting a lot of light. So if you got a number of plants and you put them on a square and you put a square light above it, pretty good chance the plants around the edges will not grow as fast as the ones in the middle or will not look as good as the ones in the middle. So, so do we have the footprint that we have to consider, too? I'm going to just talk about the different types of lighting. LED lighting is unique because you can specify exactly the colors you want in LED lighting. And so in this situation, this particular light, which is um, very common to the, light, the LED lights that we have at uh, Dakota College, we have some blue in it, and then we have yellows and reds, and it extends beyond that a little bit. The blues tend to help a plant uh, grow upward, but if you only have blue light, it tends to elongate rather quickly, becomes a long stemmy plant. The reds, on the other hand, if you have strictly red, it'll be a short, bulky type plant. So it depends on, you know, someplace in between. You kind of need, you kind of need both is what you really need. So in this particular situation, uh, it, most of the colors in between have been eliminated. And so that makes for a rather efficient energy-wise light system. And then at the bottom ones, those are little extremes. But you, you, a plant kind of like us, we need, we need a broad source of food. So does a plant when it comes to light. Uh, you can't see this row, but the one, the one on your left is a high-pressure sodium. That's the kind of light that it puts out. Not a lot of blues, so that's a concern. The metal highlight um, does a better job of, of a broader spectrum. Uh, fluorescents aren't, aren't too bad either. Those work relatively well. So they just have some inefficiencies with the green in the middle. So, yeah, light is kind of an issue. And I always say if you, if kind of the breaking period point in time is October 15th, after October 15th, you're not going to get an, a lot of light all the way through 20th of February. That period of time, you need to make sure that you have light, even if you're inside and you have your plants in, near the window. So. And then we talked about oxygen. You've got to have oxygen in the water. And so uh, if you've got a deep water culture system, it's great. This, you can hear water running. There's, we're, we're getting plenty of oxygen in the water this way with this system.
Oh, and fertilizers. Fertilize so I brought I brought a a, a empty bag. We buy a lot of um, Jacks type nutrients, but it's a hydroponics type fertilizer. It dissolves rather quickly in in a uh, in hydroponic system. So that's a common one. I mean, there's a lot of other ones too that you can buy. This tends to be with this NPK 10, 30, 20, tends to be more of a bedding type uh, fertilizer, flowering type plant because the, the phosphorus is rather high in it. But uh, I I. I would recommend that you buy a hydroponics type fertilizer if you're going to have a system. And, and you can go on Amazon and, and just Google that way and that's, that'll come up for you. If you were to decide to mix your own and make your own uh, fertilizers, there can be some issues because when mixing some fertilizers, some nutrients will precipitate out if there's the right conditions. So you want to make sure you... I would strongly suggest you start with a hydroponics type fertilizer to start with. Um, two kinds of fertilizers, I mentioned this before, is a salt based fertilizer, that's what this one is, and then the organic type fertilizer. The salt based fertilizer, as those plants use that, you need to replenish the fertilizer, right? Well, in a salt-based fertilizer, after, your water, after a while, your water becomes very salty, and it can't continue to take up the nutrients. So about every three weeks in an RO system or a system like that, then you need to dump the water and put new water in it, put new fertilizer in again. So, and that's, you know, a small system. If you have that at your house, you want to replenish your water once in a while. So. In a, in a commercial operation, they always use RO water because then you know where you're at, your point uh, in parts per million, what your water is. So at uh, DCB, we do, we, uh, we start, we use RO water in our hydroponics. It typically runs 15 to 20 parts per million after it's been cleaned. But I think our botanical water, I don't remember what it is, it's like nine, 900 to 1,000 parts per million, so it's really high, so we have to filter out a lot of, a lot of that. And um, if you use your water um, unfiltered, try to, there's usually instructions with, the, with that nitrogen or with the nutrient that you buy and it'll kind of tell you put so many tablespoons in a gallon or that type of thing. If it still doesn't answer, you can always let me know, contact, and I can probably give you an idea. So. But you can see that I, we've got different vegetables. And they, of course, all require different amounts of nitrogen. You can see like strawberries, for instance, doesn't require a lot of nitrogen. Peppers and cucumbers and tomatoes and melons and roses all do require quite a bit of nitrogen. So it depends on what you're growing, too. You can get, if you're going to grow like this type of a uh, system, I use a 20, 20, 20 uh, hydroponics and I start, like I say, started with 15 parts per million and I try to get it up to about 300 parts per million when I've added the fertilizer. So I just keep adding some fertilizer until I get it to about, um, about 300 parts per million. And I use just a simple little EC meter and not a big deal and you uh, stir your water and it'll give you an idea of what your of what your uh, parts per million are so questions on that part in an aquaponics system how, what's like the fish to plant ratio to have adequate fertilizer so um there's one step in there and it, um, it has to do with bacterial surface area mm -hmm. because you need the right number of bacteria to break down the fish waste. And if you don't have the, the right amount of bacteria, then your ammonia levels go way up and it kills the fish and, and hurts, harms the plants. 
Um, so it's a really difficult, it's kind of a complex question, but um, we have the system that we have at DCB right now uh, it's set up for about 150 tilapias that could be like three quarter pound and that would supply enough nutrients for two small greenhouses that are like 15 by 40 and one large greenhouse that's 40 by 100 and supply all the nutrients we would need for those off of 150 fish if you have like two little goldfish they'll do a tabletop full of nutrients yeah, it doesn't take a lot, surprising. And then if you send out water sample off and say, well, I want to have it tested to see what's in it, it'll come back and it'll say there's no nutrients in it at all. But a lot of the testing that happens is on salt-based nutrients. So it's very difficult for most test houses to test natural nutrients like that. So I didn't answer your question. But if you were to say, I want to grow 50 pounds of lettuce, Keith, what do I need for a system? I could tell you what, I could calculate that and tell you what that is. So. so then the other part is, I think I asked this question way back. Oh, I was talking about P-Rock. And the thing with P-Rock, particularly where I'm at, um, is that it's got a pH of about 8.1, 8.2. When I pour some vinegar in, it'll sizzle. And so I could not, when I first started in aquaponics way back in 2001, 2002, I could not figure out why my strawberries had chlorosis all the time because I knew I had enough iron in the water all the time. But when you start to look at uh, this particular chart here, the widest part of the chart is the most available part of nutrients. And as you can see, when you get, when you get out here in the 8.5, 8, 8 some of these become very narrow. And that's because the pH ties up those nutrients. So it's also important that you look at your pH levels all the time too. And I strongly recommend like six to seven pH typically. Um, what is a pH here with soil pH? It's neutral. Very fortunate, yeah. So uh, I know where I'm at, it tends to be right around 7, 8 to 8, 1, someplace in the soil, soil pH. It's a little acidic. Yeah. And then it goes into uh, perennials and it comes back to neutral. Oh, it does, huh? Oh, well. So part of that's because of bacterial action, I suppose. In biology. In biology, back, yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So anyway, I just wanted to put that up there so you should know the pH level of your water too, especially if you're starting to see some yellowing of the leaves with the dark green veins in it or that type of situation. Then you kind of know you've got it. You might have enough nutrients in there, but the pH is screwing you up a little bit. So, so my P-Rock up there, like I said, was messing up my whole system. <coughs> and... Um, Basically, we had to eliminate that, take that out, and put some neutral type material in there. <coughs> I still actually have some in my bed. So, but you know, and the other thing in aquaponics is when you really, really get your system working, your pH level will fluctuate like between 6.8 and 7 all the time, and that's because some of the biological activity that's going on in the water. <coughs> So that's another thing is kind of watch pH a little bit. And you can get, these are like, this is like $20. And you can get a pH meter for about the same thing. So at home, it's not a terribly expensive deal. And of course, I'm showing a big commercial operation here. But whenever you have a system like this, at some point, you should tear it down, to totally clean it, um, sanitize it before you use it again. So. That's it. Questions? Does anybody have a, a hydroponic system at home? Do you? Just a wick system. 
Oh, sure. That works. Part of the question about your flowering stuffs are the tomatoes, cucumbers, or strawberries in an indoor setting, what do you do to get them to flower or to produce that? Yeah. So I can, so I, majority of the reason is because of light. It could be a nutrient. So I up uh, my light levels quite a bit. Um, and so I've got a meter th uh, that, that we use and it, it measures that par range. And uh, if we go outside right now, I'm thinking we're probably at about five, 600. Um, and so there, <laughs> There is a formula, but what we do is, and I have my students do it, is at uh, DCB is this fall now, the days get shorter and shorter, right? So I know at some point the tomatoes are gonna say, yeah, we're not gonna bloom anymore, we're gonna vegetate. So then I have my students go through the formula and say, okay, we've get, we're getting uh, tw our 18 units of light from the sun today, we need to be at 30, how many more hours of sunlight are supplemental light do I need and so they will figure it out but it you need to get an idea of what your supplemental light is putting out and it varies of course by the height of it and tomato is weird if you're if you're growing a vine type because then you've got the leaves up and down and they need to get light too so you actually put in vertical lights if you to get them to grow are you talking about like a vine type or a bush type or well just like I other instance, I just have a strawberry in a pot. And yep. I've had it for a couple of years now. I haven't had anything. To Nothing to bloom? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, has it been inside? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Strawberries need um, like 18 to 20 units of light a day to get them to bloom. And, and that's what we're at, about where we're at right now. Strawberries would still bloom, so... <clears throat> so in a, in a, just another thing, in a greenhouse or in a high tunnel situation, it filters out about half the light. So, you know, we could be at 10 to 9 to 10 units of light right now in a, in a high tunnel. So tomatoes will start to change pretty soon. They'll, they'll, they'll back off on their blossoms with the amount of light that we have in about three weeks. The other thing that I, that when we talk about outside is um, I work a lot with hemp I mentioned before and hemp is what we, the hemp that I work with is what we call a photoperiod type of a plant. So it begins to bloom when there's a certain length of darkness every day. And uh, we, we do a, we trial a lot of different cultivars, but we find a lot of them. I've got, I've got hemp that has bloomed already got nice flowers on it but I've got hemp that's not even started to bloom and in a photo period type of plant some plants uh, it depends on the length of the day and it's really critical so if I grow a plant here and at this location and I grow a plant in Botna North Dakota there's about eight minutes of daylight different right now in Botna we have about eight, eight minutes more of daylight every day than you do here at this location. And it's weird, but I can see it in the hemp plants that base everything on photo period. If I brought some of those hemp plants down here, and we did that at Absarac, I did one with NDSU, and they had plants blooming up to two weeks earlier than I had them blooming up there, the same plants. So that's kind of off on a different thing, but light does a lot of things that people don't realize the plants. So. Questions anymore? Thank you. Yeah.